Hey everyone, welcome to Meeple Bits. Thanks for joining me for this setup and how to for the game Wayfarers of the South Tigris, a game for one to five players with a playtime of, I'm going to air quote this one, 60 to 90 minutes. Not a single of my playthroughs managed to get within that window of time. Uh, we are not going to address solo mode in this video, but uh, if it's something that you are interested in, please leave a comment down below and I'll uh, look to try to get that one up uh, in the future. Uh, otherwise, guys, um, we're going to go ahead and tackle this uh, dice placement, worker placement, um, tableau management uh, style game. So let's jump right in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to what will be a two-player setup for the game Wayfarers of the South Tigris. To begin, we're going to set up the main play area. Start by taking the three main board sections, putting them together in the center of play. The side doesn't matter, they are dual-sided, and it can add randomization and to the game. However, if this is your first time playing, go ahead and set it up in the way that I've done so on the screen now. Next, shuffle the five decks, placing them in their respective areas on the board. The Townsfolk cards, the land cards, which have sort of the yellowish background, the space cards, the sea cards with the blue background, and lastly, the inspiration cards, which have the tags in the corners of blue and yellow. Once these are in their places, draw up the top four cards of each of the decks, putting them in the spaces to the right or left of their decks on the board. It should look something like this. Next, shuffle the journal tiles. There should be 10 total, but just put them all in your hand, give them a nice toss, and randomly place them in the 10 available spots on the journal track on the main board. These are the spaces that are two next to each other that are missing an icon on the main board. Now, pick the four green workers, placing them one on each of the four indicated spaces on the main board. Now, take the 10 special upgrade tiles. These would have a pink border. Put them all in their respective locations on the left side of the board, depending on your perspective, but on the left side of the board, one in each of the icon locations. Now that we've placed all the special upgrade tiles, the pink tiles in play, we want to add the remaining upgrade tiles. For this, we're going to add one upgrade tile for each player. So in this two-player game, we'll add two of each of the colors, starting with green, yellow, black, and blue. In a three- or four-player game, you'll add in those additional three or four tiles. Now that the main play area is complete, begin setting up for each player. Start by giving each player one player board, dealt at random. They are the same around the edges. The difference is going to be in the caravan area. Provide each player with the five dice of their color, placing two on the main board by the, uh, the temples. All players should receive 15 influence in their color, as well as one player marker that would go on the main board on the far left of the journal track. And lastly, provide each player with one yellow and one blue worker. Now, depending on your player count, you're going to assign players one through four a little bit different on their starting silver, provisions, and influence. Decide which player is going to go first. The first player would then receive three coins, two provisions, and place one of their influence marker into the blue guild. Refer to the instruction book for all play counts as this will vary, but in this two player game, player one's going to have three silver, two provision, and one influence, and then player two is going to receive the same, three silver, two provision, however, they're going to place one influence in the blue guild and one additional influence in the yellow guild. And as always, make sure off to the side somewhere you have the supply pool of remaining silver and provisions for all players to access. With that, player setup and the main game is complete. You're ready to begin play. 
Wayfarers of the South Tigris is a game played out over an indeterminate number of rounds, where each player on their turn will take one action, continuing the game play until the end game is triggered. In this game, the end game is triggered when a player's journal track or journal track marker reaches any of the five spaces at the end of the journal track. Once that end game is triggered, all players including the player that triggered the end game, will receive one additional turn. On a player's turn, a player may take those one of three actions, either placing a die into their panorama or tableau area on cards that they own, placing a worker out into the main area on any of the available spots around the board, or taking a rest action, allowing them to collect and re-roll any of their dice. Let's take a quick look at the different spots around the main board, starting with the journal track. As players progress their tokens along the journal track, you'll notice that there are additional bonuses and requirements in these ink blots along the way. This first section is free for any player to travel into, but it's every subsequent area that they want to go or new parchment they want to traverse onto would have a prerequisite. Additionally, the first player that becomes adjacent to the green worker may take that green worker into their supply. Workers are not owned by any player, but are owned by all players, depending on where they are. So it is entirely possible that a player may have six workers and another player none. On the, on the journal track, you'll notice, again, these markers. Uh, refer to any iconography in the uh, instruction book uh, if you're you know, getting lost. But, for example, this top ink blotch would require a player to have hired two townsfolk into their panorama. Over here, it would require to, them to have had at least one green tile upgrade. And all the way over here, it would say require for them to have four uh, star tags in their panorama. Additionally, there are the upgrade tiles that can be had by landing on specific or assigning specific actions to allow it to do so. The green tiles always cost silver. The space tiles, the blue tile, the water tiles, the land tiles may all be had with silver or using influence from one of the three corresponding guilds. The, the special upgrade or the pink tiles would only happen through these spots on the journal track or any cards that would give you this icon, which would trigger you to collect one of these special tokens. Around the edges, you'll notice that there are meeple icons above the land, water, inspiration, and townsfolk cards. For townsfolk, you may only use a green worker to use one of the actions below that worker. In the land tile, you may use a green or yellow worker. In the water section, you may use a green or blue worker. And on the inspiration section, you may use any of these actions using any of the three available colors of meeples. And lastly, we have then the cards around the edge of the board, which would be collected and added into the player's tableau or panorama area. Land and water cards you would build out to either the left or the right of your main play area, and I'll show you an example in a moment, and townsfolk cards would always be tucked under land or water cards as long as they have the corresponding tags, which I'll address in just a moment, and space cards must go above either land or sea cards. If you don't have an available uh, land or sea card uh, in your panorama, then you cannot collect a space card because there's nowhere for that card to be placed above. The same with a townsfolk card. If you don't have an available land or sea card for you to tuck below that uh, location, you cannot acquire a townsfolk card. The exception being the inspiration cards off to the side here, because you can still collect these even though you cannot tuck these above a space card, because you'll be able to discard this doing the associated action that is located below it. When tucked, this allows you a condition to double the victory points of your space cards. And then with that, you're ready to begin play. Let's take a look at those three actions in a little bit more detail.
in the player's area, you have your caravan, you have your space row, which can go in either direction, and then you have your sea row, which would go off this way, and your land row, which would go off this way. So with land buildings, you would build this way, water buildings, you would build this way. So open waters and harbors would go off this way. And then underneath any of these locations, understanding that these two tiles on every player board are considered locations for purposes of being able to tuck cards underneath from townsfolk, as well as the tags that are located above them. Inside your caravan, you'll notice a collection of icons. On your caravan, this is where you place all upgrade tiles that you acquire from the main board, whether that be green, yellow, blue, or black, or even the special. All upgrade tiles will go here, allowing you to empower the dice as you roll them. When you cover any of these icons with a special tile, you then immediately take its effect. It happens one time. Once you've used it, it's gone. But then you have now the tile in place of these icons. Your one always has a camel asset and your six will always have a telescope asset. Keeping that in mind when planning out your turns throughout the game. So at this stage, all players should go ahead and give their dice a roll. Setting them up so that you can kind of use them and assign them as necessary. Player one having a four, five, six, player two having a one, four, six. So as mentioned, on a player's turn, you're going to take one of three actions. Action one being the placement of a die. Action two, the placement of a worker, or action three, resting to collect uh, your dice back and re-roll any and all that you choose. Additionally, when taking the rest action, as indicated uh, by this icon down here, which is might be a little hard to see, but I'll try to put it up on screen. If you have zero or one die left available to use, it would trigger any additional resting uh, bonuses. In this case, all players get the resting bonus of being able to journal and take a silver. Understanding that all bonuses are optional. So a player may take a silver and not take uh, the journal action if they choose. Additionally, they can take these things in any order. If they would rest and they need that silver to pay for something that would otherwise trigger, they can do it in an order that allows them to do so. When taking a dice action, or when t placing a die, you're going to always place a die into an available die spot. As indicated by these white squares, sometimes with icons, sometimes without, or rather assets. The die then, ha in the column of the die, have those assets available and associated to them. On a player's turn, you may also use any of the guild abilities. The blue guild has the ability to spend one influence from the guild so that you can have a temporary ship asset. The yellow guild allows you to, re to increase or decrease one or two dice. And the black guild allows you to spend an influence to step one further when journaling. This would happen when you use it. It is not a subsequent action on your turn. It is in tandem with the action being taken and may only be used once on that turn. So if a player were to assign a die on their turn, they would take a die from their available die pool and placing it in an available spot on their panorama. Right now, players don't have any additional cards, but if I did, I might have available spots. So example... I have a four, five, six. These four and five have no associated asset tags with them, so they could only be placed right now into spots that have blanks. However, this six has a telescope asset and could be placed into this top section where it requires a telescope asset to do that action. When placing a worker, a player may then take that worker, placing it onto the card of their choice, and taking the action above that card. All workers placed into the main area go onto the cards, 
and the action is the one above the card. Then, when a player ever brings a card into or purchases a card into their tableau, they then also collect any workers that might be located on those uh, cards. So if there were a blue marker or a blue worker here and player two brought this into their tableau like so, they would bring this into their available worker pool. And then lastly is the rest action. As I mentioned, if you've placed all of your dice and have one or zero remaining, it would trigger the rest bonuses. But if I had placed all of my dice like this and I choose to rest, I would collect my dice, re-roll them, ready for assignment for my next turn, and then take any associated bonuses while resting. In this case, it would be journaling one, one space and taking a silver. Again, these are optional. I don't have to take them if I choose not to. And that, by and large, is how you play Wayfarers of the South Tigris. There are going to be a lot of nuances into this game, and we're going to kind of dive into a few examples here in just a moment. But gameplay will continue with all players taking a turn, doing one action on their turn, doing that subsequent action, and continuing play until a player reaches one of the last of the five spots on the uh, journal track. So let's do a couple examples so that we can get an idea of play because there are going to be a lot of little nuances during the course of the game that would make this video go well over an hour to completely address. But with that, starting with player one, let's have them take an action on their turn. They're going to use their number five die, assign it down here into this spot, giving them the ability to either take in a Townsfolk card or acquire two provision. In this case, let's have the player acquire a Townsfolk card. Let's take the Envoy into play. This Envoy has a requirement of being placed underneath a city tag as indicated down here. And I only have one city available here. So I would be able to put this worker under here. This worker could not go under the harbor because it did not have an associated tag. Now that this city tile has a worker in the city, he is providing a camel always available into this location. Additionally, he does also provide a pigeon, but that may or may not come into play depending on how I do my actions. But now on subsequent turns, I may use any die in this location because its associated asset is being essentially paid for by the worker. So now player two's turn. Let's go over to player two and let's say, for example, they wanted to use a blue worker and place it up onto this card. So they're gonna place a blue worker here. That allows them to purchase a blue tile from the main board for the cost of three silver or two influence. They do not have two influence in the blue guild, so they're gonna spend their three silver and they're going to bring in one of the upgrade tiles into their tableau. So let's go ahead and associate this one right down here as an example. This now allows the four die to have a ship asset and the five die to have a pigeon asset associated when assigning the dice. I've covered up one silver, so I'll take one silver back into my hand. That's the end of the turn. Back to the next player or round the table it would go. Back to player one. Now that they have this association or this asset available, I'm gonna go ahead and assign my number four right down here. I'm going to spend the two provision that it takes to then acquire a land card and a silver. I'm going to go ahead and grab that silver into my hand now because I take the order of operation however I see fit. And then I'm going to take, uh, let's do this, this land tile here, or this land card here. So this land card is going to come into my panorama like so. This now gives me another city tag as indicated in the upper left-hand corner for end game scoring purposes. 
And then I also now collect additional bonuses. I have an immediate bonus as indicated by the lightning bolt here to allow me to place an influence on a card. So I will take one of my influence and place it on a card like so. Back to player two, which is now a good time to address how these influence on cards work. Ah, all cards should slide. New one should be brought up. And anytime a player wants to interact with this card, whether that is taking the card or placing a worker on the card, they must first pay red player either one silver or one provision to remove the influence to interact with that card. And so back to player two, they're gonna use their number four die that now has a ship asset to come down here into this uh, harbor to pay two provisions to the supply and collect one of these ship cards. They are gonna go ahead and take back into their supply, the one where they had placed the worker, bringing that worker back into their supply, bringing this right alongside into their panorama. And then anytime you link a lightning bolt from the left side of the new card with the bonus from the right side of the previous card, or in this case, the default tile, you're going to trigger instantly anything that is connected. So here, the player may place one worker into the yellow guild, or sorry, one influence in the yellow guild, and place one influence on any card. Let's say they wanted to put an influence on this card, making sure to go ahead and slide everything down, drawing up anything new. So that'll do it for the examples. Once a player triggers end game and all players have taken their final turn, you're gonna move into end game scoring. How that works is, you'll notice at the top of all player boards is a track. You're gonna start by tallying up any of the like tags, example, all, all cities, all villas or vistas, all harbors and all open waters. So if a player acquires six cities, they would acquire 12 victory points. So player one, as an example, does have two city tags because they did acquire that second city. So they would get two victory points for having two city tags. And you would do this for every tag. Then, for every set of all four of the tags, you acquire an additional five victory points. Next, you're going to score any of your space cards, including the bonuses from the inspirations that you might have collected and achieved their requirements. So, example, if a player had this inspiration card tucked underneath this space card, they would need to have acquired eight water cards in their panorama to double the victory condition of the space card that it's tucked under. Next, score any victory points that a player might have had in their caravan. So all special tiles have victory points associated to them. All green tiles have victory points associated with them and some of the other ones as well. So you would add those up, add them to your score. And then lastly, you're going to address guild majorities. In each of the guild, the player that has the majority influence will receive an additional three victory points. If there's a tie in any of the guilds, no players receive the victory points. Once tally is complete, the player with the most victory points is the winner. If there's a tie, the player with the most influence in black guild is the winner, followed by yellow, followed by blue. If there's still a tie after having no majority in those guilds, then all players who won share the victory. So that's going to do it here for Wayfarers of the South Tigris. I'm going to go ahead and tear everything down and uh, bring you guys my afterthoughts. Stay tuned. Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that setup and how-to for the game Wayfarers of the South Tigris. With that, let's go ahead and jump into my afterthoughts, starting with components. Overall, components in this one are what I come to expect from a Shem game. Satisfying, good, the board quality is, is solid, artwork is great, um, meeples are general wooden meeples, most of the uh, other pieces are also wooden tokens, the dice are small and light, but they work. My challenge is that uh, the provisions are chits, they're punch board. 
So that was big bummer. I did. I do have some um, some separate tokens that I'll probably uh, use instead. Um, otherwise, you know, overall pretty good. I did also purchase some uh, aftermarket clips to help hold the boards together. So that's something that would have been a, a nice inclusion. But overall, uh, components are, are what you would expect from this style of game. Um, the game itself, we enjoyed. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and preface everything about this afterthoughts is that this is a game that I definitely did enjoy, even in all of its complexities. This one rated on the BGG weight scale of, I want to say, maybe a four out of five. So this might actually be the most, you know, complicated game that I own. Uh, Brass being the previous uh, highest weighted game, uh, according to BGG. So even though you're only doing one thing on your turn, that one thing could be so many things, and then it's a, it's a culmination of all these single action decisions that um, you know, amount to be what your end result is. So in a lot of my playthroughs, uh, you know, it, it was super interesting that in a couple of games where I swore I was going to win, I ended up not even coming in second place. And in some of these games, I, I even rushed my way through the journal track to try to trigger Endgame uh, sooner than it otherwise naturally might have because I wanted to, what I perceive, lock up my victory. So I, I bring that up because why is Wayfarers of the South Tigris a game you may want to add into your collection? Well, because the sort of unpredictability of the end game. Who's really going to come out on top? There are so many components happening around the table that it's hard to really look at any other person's uh, panorama and say, wow, they're so far ahead of me. Uh, or man, I'm in the lead and, and obviously not. So that aspect of it was a lot of fun because, you know, it's, it's just, it's anyone's game almost the whole time. Um, so yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed that. And so that's definitely a reason if, if you'd like that type of action in your game. If you enjoy worker placements, if you enjoy dice placement, if you enjoy tableau building, or you know, in this case, panorama building, uh, all you know, factors in this game to include, and, and they, they do it well. So it's different sort of genres, uh, all kind of you know, meshed together, but done well. And because you're only taking that one action on your turn, you're doing one of three things, um, it, it really helps streamline the entire process. Um, why is Wayfarers of South Tigris a game you may not want to add into your collection? Well, I guess first and foremost, um, you, you can't make decisions. <laughs> so in this game, there's a lot of decisions to be made, even though that decision is predicated around one action, that one action could be, um, for, you know, on the board alone when placing a worker, um, you know, it could be one of 12 different available spots to choose from. And then when you're placing your dice, while your dice are influenced a little bit by what your caravan has, again, by the time you've built up your panorama, you now have worker place, like 12 places to put your worker. Then you could have another, you know, six to 10 places to put your, your different dice. So on your turn, you gotta pick that one thing. And if that, Decision making is intimidating or frustrating, probably not the right game for you. Number two, big reason why you may not want to add this into your collection is because you don't have a large table. You, you, uh, table space is a premium for you. Uh, <laughs> because this game, pretty much in every game, it'll come, to, it'll, a point will come where you've built up your panorama to, to, you know, whether it be left or right, and the other person is also building out left and right that you guys are invariably going to run into one another. And so more than one time during the course of the game, you know, is someone kind of shifting down their, their panorama just to create a little bit more space. So if table space is a premium, probably not going to be one you're going to get to the table frequently. Um, Otherwise, you know, another reason why you may not want to add it into your collection is, you know, it is it is a weightier game. It can be a longer game. Um, you know, you got to have you got to have a, a crew that is willing to put in the time. As, as I mentioned up front, we've not gotten this game in under the box allotted time in any of the playthroughs. But anyway, 
Overall though, for me and my table mates, it was a very enjoyable game and one that uh, was requested to come back to the table more than once. So yeah, I'm uh, happy that this was a Kickstarter pickup for me and I just thoroughly enjoy Shen games uh, on a personal level anyway. I think for the most part, he's really just hit the right formulas through and through. So that's going to do it for this one, guys. If you have any questions about Wayfarers of the South Tigris, please leave a comment down below. I'm happy to answer them as best that I can. If you've enjoyed the video and liked the content, I do appreciate the support. Feel free to leave a like and subscribe. And as always, everyone, until next time, thanks so much for watching.